Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at consolidated financial statement and at this point we're going to go ahead and prepare the consolidated financial statement. We've been looking at journal entries, eliminating journal entries, now we're going to look at the full picture. So I'm going to break this session into basically two parts. The first part we're going to look at completed consolidated financial statements. I'm going to show you what it looks like, the ideas behind them. Then we will work a simulation that's going to show us how we end up preparing those consolidated financial statements. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do so, I also would like to remind you, this lecture is designed for CPA candidate. This, this lecture is designed for CPA candidate. If you want more advanced explanation about this topic, go to farhatlectures.com and subscribe to my advanced accounting course. Matter of fact, if you are a subscriber, you have access to my advanced accounting. So this is a summary, a review. But if you want more, again, I will be inviting you throughout this session Every time I say, if you want more about this, go to my advanced accounting. And the reason I say this because advanced accounting students, they learn a little bit more in the college course versus CPA candidate who are preparing for the exam. Let's go ahead and get started. When two corporations having a parent sub relationship, they continue to exist as separate legal entities. What does that mean? It means we have the parent that keep their books separately and we have the sub, two totally independent companies. And only the parent or the acquirer prepare a consolidated financial statement. Then at some point, they're going to have to prepare consolidated financial statement, which would include the parent plus the sub equal to the consolidated. But each one of them will keep everything separately. So in this session, I'm going to show you first the consolidated. I'm going to show you how we end up with the consolidated. Starting with the consolidated balance sheet, we will include 100% of the assets and liabilities of the parent and the sub. Well, hold on a second. What if we own 95%? What, what if we only own 70%? It does not matter. We include 100% after eliminating all the intercompany transaction. So what happened to the remaining, the part that we don't own? Well, that's fine. The equity section of the consolidated balance sheet include only the parent equity with an additional line representing the non-controlling interest. So the non-controlling interest, which are the 30% or the 20% that, that decided not to sell their stock, their interest will be represented in a line and a separate line on the equity section called non-controlling interest NCI, or it used to be called minority interest. And you need to understand how we create NCI, what changes NCI, which we covered this in a prior session. So the equity of the subsidiary is eliminated when consolidating. So nothing from the equity of the subsidiary will appear on the consolidated financial statement. So let's take a look at this illustration. Basically, practically there's no adjustments. We have the parent, separate books. We have the sub, no adjustments. We have the investment. The investment account will have to be eliminated because when we purchase the comp when we purchase the sub, we create the investment account. When we can when we consolidate, we have to remove because we're consolidating the assets and the liabilities. We cannot keep the assets and the liabilities and keep the investment because what we paid for the company is for the asset and the liabilities. If we're adding the assets and the liabilities, we cannot keep the investment. Therefore, we have to remove the investment. So we're going to credit the investment and. The credit is against the equity section of the sub. So we add up all the property, plant, and equipment. And notice here, we're keeping it simple, no adjustments, which will work an adjustment shortly. Again, we add all the liabilities and we're keeping it simple, no adjustments. And simply put, the investment is eliminated against the equity section. So we have to eliminate the common stock of the sub, additional paid in capital of the sub, the retained earnings of the sub. And notice in this example, we eliminated all the equity section of the sub. And it appears in this example, we don't own 100% of this company, we created an NCI. We don't have to worry about how we did it. The point I'm trying to show you is, when you debit investment, when investment goes down, when you debit investment, you have to bring down against that investment, common stock, additional paid in capital and retained earning. And if you did not own 100%, you remove NCI. That's This is assuming you paid exactly the book value of this of the sub otherwise we're going to work another example where we, we paid a little bit more than the identifiable net asset but this is basically what a balance sheet would look like so in the consolidated balance sheet we can see that the parent investment and the sub and the sub equity are eliminated while the non-controlling interest and ci are reported as a separate line to basically we want to keep track of those nci 
consolidated income statement. In the year of acquisition, the consolidated income statement would include, again, 100% of revenues and expenses. Well, what if we only own 90% of the company or 55% of the company? Well, it does not matter. We're going to show the NCI on a separate line. So 100% of revenues and expenses along with revenues and expenses of the sub company. So we combine both the sub and the parent 100%. The total consolidated net income should be segregated between net income attributed to the non-controlling interests. We have an NCI net income and we have net income contributed to the parent company. So simply put, let's assume we own 80% of a company. We have the parent and the sub. They consolidate everything 100%. Then notice here there is a line it says there is a line here it says net income let me highlight it in yellow net income attributed to the non-controlling interest and we subtract that amount we subtract that amount to back out because we consolidated 100 percent although we don't own 100 percent to back it out so we keep track of nci separately and you have to know how to do this we worked this in a prior session the consolidated comprehensive income same concept if we have any nci we have to keep tra keep track of nci separately now, the best way to illustrate all these concepts is to actually look at a complete simulation. This is a long simulation. Most likely, you will not see something like this on the exam. Most likely. You will see bits and pieces. Maybe you will see a smaller version of it. But you will see many multiple choice questions that you can answer by understanding this simulation. Before we look at the simulation, I would like to remind you one more time. If you're not a subscriber, to go to farhatlectures.com. Subscribe. I can help you understand this material. I can help you improve your knowledge, improve your confidence so you can pass the CPA exam. Let's go ahead and get started. On November 2nd, year one, Farhat Company announced its decision to acquire 100% of the common stock of Bryan Company by issuing 62,500 shares of its $20 par value common stock. The acquisition occurred on January 1st, year one, I'm sorry, year two, when the fair market value of the common stock was $50. We really don't care about the announcement date. The transaction took place January 1st, year two. And how much did we pay for this company? How much did Farhat pay for the company? Farhat issued 62,500 shares, paying $50. Uh, the share is worth $50. So if we take 62,500 times $50, they paid for the company 3,125,000. Just copy this down, paid this much. On the acquisition date, the net book value of Brian net asset was 575. That's their net book value. Well, the fair value amounted to 825. So notice here, from a book value perspective, 825 minus 575, we have something inflated. 825 minus 575, not inflated, that's a, that we have something that's worth more than its book value. Well, it says the only difference between the book value and the fair value is attributed to a land. Okay, so this 250 belonged to a land. Make a note of it that has appreciated in value. Moreover, Brian had in process R&D of 150 that will be amortized. What does that mean? If you are giving this piece of information, it means there's we have to add 150,000 in a new asset called in process R&D because when the company, when Brian company was conducting this R&D, they had to expense it. Since we are buying the company, it's in process R&D, and we are told here we're gonna be amortizing it, it means the R&D is successful. We bought it, it means it's somehow we, we, we know it's successful. Therefore, we're gonna amortize it over five years. So that's another asset. So we're gonna add the land as a new asset. We're gonna add in process R&D as a new asset. Make a note of those. For year two, Brian re recorded net income of 437500 and paid cash dividend of 187 This is year two. This is year two. So the subsidiary made a profit and paid a dividend. Make a note of these numbers. On December 31st, year two, the equity section of Brian Company included common stock of 1250000 APIC of 500000 and retained earning of 625 Hold on a second. So this was the retained earning at the end of year two. So this is 625 here. This is year two. Sorry, this is year two. So what was retained earning year one? We're going to have to find out what was retained earnings at the beginning of the year or at the end of year one, January 1st, year two, which is the beginning of year two or the end of year one. On the other hand, 
The equity section of Farhat included common stock of 6,250,000, a pick of 1,250,000, and retained earnings of 3,750,000. The first thing we're going to do, based on this information, prepare the journal entry to record the acquisition. Well, that's easy. We already kind of figured out the acquisition cost, $3,150. we are going to debit investment for that amount, $3,125,000, $3,125,000, credit common stock, the number of shares times the par value, and credit additional paid in capital, $1,875,000. Now, bear in mind, when we consolidate, we're going to have to eliminate the investment account. The investment account is eliminated because we purchased the assets and liabilities of the company. We purchased the net asset, which is the equity of the company. We cannot keep both. We have to eliminate the investment against the equity to keep the assets and the liabilities and the consolidated financial statements. And we'll see in the example. Prepare the acquisition date eliminating entry. Now, the acquisition date eliminating entry, it means when we purchase this company, when Farhat purchased Brian, there is an eliminating entry that's going to eliminate the sub equity because we cannot have the sub equity. We cannot have the sub equity. And we have to see how we process this entry because we have to add more assets to our books. Okay. So when preparing the eliminating entry, the equity section of the sub should be fully eliminated. We should know this. The sub have to be gone. The sub equity has to be gone because we paid for it. Okay. Therefore, to prepare the eliminating entry, we should determine the amount of the equity section of Brian on that date, which is, again, now we're going to go back and figure out January 1st equity because we're eliminating on the acquisition date. On December 31st, year two, the equity section amounted, which, which we were giving this, 2375 1254 common stock, half a million of APEC, and retained earning of 625 Remember what I told you. We are giving retained earning at 625. This is December 31st, year two. But we purchased the company January 1st, year two. So we have to go back and find out what was retained earning at the beginning of the year. So we don't know what retained earning was the beginning of the year. We know that we had net income minus dividend. So we added net income minus the dividend gave us ending retained earnings. What do we have to do now? Well. We were told what was net income. We were told what was dividend. Now we have to go backward. We have to take the ending retained earning, add the dividend, subtract the income. We come up with beginning retained earnings. So we were told that ending retained earning was 625. We were told on the prior slide that we paid cash dividend of 187,500. If we paid it, now we have to add it to go backward. We're going backward. And net income, since we added net income, now we have to subtract net income of 437,500. Therefore, the beginning retained earning X was 375,000. So this is the retained earning at the acquisition date, 375. It was not giving. We had to back out into it. So be careful. What date is retained earning given to you? Now, as a result, the total equity of the subsidiary on the acquisition date amounted to 2,125,000. Account computed as follow: common stock, APIC, and paid in capital, uh, retained earnings, 375, what we just calculated. So the 2,125,000 represent the value of Brian's net asset. Remember, the value of Brian's net asset is 2,125,000. Remember that we paid 3 million. How much did we pay? We paid. Uh, for this company, we paid 3125 So we paid, notice, we paid 3125 for a company that's worth 2125 for their net asset. So we paid an additional $1 million, an additional above their net asset. We already know, we, we, we were told in the problem earlier that the land was overstated by 250 Well, that's fine, so this explained 250 of the million that's gonna left us with 750. Well, we were also told that we have an in process RD that we need to capitalize of 150. Well, that explains 150 of the 750 that keeps us with six hundred thousand dollar. There is no explanation for this. Well, if there is no explanation and we paid extra, we're gonna call the six hundred thousand goodwill. So therefore, what's gonna happen? 250 goes to the land of that excess amount. 150 goes to process R&D, and what's left, 600,000 goes to goodwill. Now, let's prepare the adjust the 
eliminating entry. We're going to debit common stock for the sub. Debit paid in capital, debit retained earnings, the beginning retained earnings. This is for the sub, gone. We're going to have to debit land. We have to add the land to the consolidated. We have to add the intangible, the R&D. We have to add the goodwill, and we eliminate it against the investment, which is 3125000 Assume that Farhat accounts for the investment in Brian using the equity method. Prepare the year-end eliminating entry. Let's take a look at the equity method. Given that Farhat uses the equity method to internally account for its investment, the value would look something like this. The acquisition date of the investment was 3125000 This is what we paid for under the equity method. We increase it by the net income. We reduce it by the dividend. Therefore, ending investment using the equity method is 3375000 How do we process this entry? We're going to debit common stock. Debit paid in capital, debit retained earnings. Now, retained earnings will be retained earnings at December 31st, year two retained earnings, which is which is different than so 625 is different than the beginning retained earnings of 375 why because now net income and net income and dividend is reflected in that retained earnings the rest is the same and the difference will go to the investment account so simply put if you notice here the difference between those two went to retained earning and the difference is accounted for in the investment. So this is the equity method. And hopefully you should be very familiar with the equity method. Now, now what we're going to do, we're going to look at series of, of eliminating entries to just bring all of this together, starting with an inventory intercompany transaction. During the year, Farhat sold merchandise inventory with a cost of 1.5 million to Brian for 1,650,000. So notice here we have an intercompany profit of 150. Brian sold 40% of these merchandise to an external party, okay, with a profit margin of 25%. So what do we have to do now? Well, this is an intercompany transaction, intercompany sale, intercompany cost of goods sold, intercompany profit. We have to eliminate this. So the elimination of intercompany sales and cost of goods sold is pretty straightforward. It consists of debiting sales and crediting cost of goods sold. However, the profit is separated between the profit on the goods sold to third parties, which should be eliminated from cost of goods sold. Remember, this 150, some of it already sold because we sold 40%. And the profit on the goods is still available in inventory. Remember, if we sold 40, we still have 60. So 40 and 60, so 60 of this is 90,000. So we still have 90,000 in inventory. And we sold 60. So we have to reduce the 60 and we have to reduce the 90. Why? Because those are inflated figures. This is part of the intercompany profit. So 60000 is cost of goods sold to a third party. So the eliminating entry would look something like this. We have to obviously debit sales because we sold to a, to a, to, to a sub. Simply put, when the parent sold, they debited account receivable 1650 credited sales 1650 debited cost of goods sold. Uh, 1.5 million credited inventory 1.5 million so we have to eliminate the sales we have to eliminate this cost of goods sold the remaining is 150 we have to also eliminate this profit now if they did not sell anything let's assume brian did not sell anything to an outside party all that we have to do is reduce inventory 150 why? Because inventory is inflated. Once we reduce inventory, it increases our cost of goods sold and it will solve the problem for the consolidation. But since 40% of it is sold and 60% remaining, we're going to eliminate, we're going to reduce cost of goods sold to external parties. So the sub has an inflated cost of goods sold of 60000 because this 150 is profit. And now they counted it as cost of goods sold. Well, we have to reduce cost of goods sold. And they still have 90,000 of the 150. Again, 60,000 was inflated cost of goods sold. The remaining is 90,000, and that's inflated inventory. What do we do with that inflated inventory? We also reduce the inflated inventory. Notice we reduce sales, we reduce cost of goods sold, intercompany cost of goods sold, external company cost of goods sold, and we reduce inventory by 90,000. Basically, what we are doing, we're going back and treating as if the sale between the sub and the parent company never was never uh, was never uh, was never achieved. 
Now also, let's assume they still have an intercompany account receivable and payable of 400,000. That's easy. We debit the, the accounts payable and we credit the receivable to eliminate any intercompany payable and receivable. Let's assume also on December 31st, year two, Brian acquired bonds from the market for 512. These bonds were issued by Farhat for 450 on December 29, the same year the bonds had a face value of 375. So they were issued at a premium. Simply put, what Farhat did, they debited cash, 450, credited bonds, payable 375, and they have a premium of 75,000. This is what the parent company did. Yes, the parent company. So they issued a bond. Well, the sub purchased the bond and they purchased it for they purchased it for 412 500 so they purchased it less than less than the book value so we have a gain so but when they purchased it the bond and the premium has to be gone so we're going to debit the bond we have to debit the bond to remove the bond we have to debit the premium to remove the premium debit the bond debit the premium remove the bond because now the bond is basically retired because because it's an intercompany transaction now, also, the investment account, Brian paid for 12500 That's an intercompany investment. It also has to be eliminated. And there's a gain. Why there's a gain? Because the bond has, has a book value of 450 we did not We did not amortize anything on this bond, to keep it simple. And Brian paid for 12500 We have a gain of 37500 Now, bear in mind that sometimes they might give you uh, the bond was purchased a year or two later so you have to amortize some of the premium not likely on the cpa exam but if you don't want to take any chances again for hat lectures and my advanced accounting i do work those scenarios let's also assume that far hat acquired brian acquired land from far hat for three hundred thousand. the land has a cost of 262 so brian purchased a piece of land that's good and they paid three hundred thousand. well if they paid three hundred thousand to far hat Farhat will have a gain, but that gain an intercompany gain. What is the gain? If my math is right, 37,500. Well, that gain has to be gone. Now, Brian has an asset, a land that's worth 300,000, but it should be reported at 262,500. We have a land that has to go down as well by 37,500 inflated land. So we have to debit the gain and credit the land. Now, if I'm going a little bit too fast, please go to the CPA review session and I explain those transactions much much more in details but this is just I'm, I'm getting I'm processing these transaction as a review to get you to the full picture to show you how all these entries eventually fit on the financial statements on the consolidated financial statements for that matter on January 1st Brian paid 150,000 to purchase an asset from Farhat the book value was 105 well if they paid from if they paid Farhat 150 for something that's worth 105, you know that Farhat will have a $45,000 gain. That gain is an intercompany gain will need to be eliminated. Farhat acquired the machine the, the machine at the beginning of the year for 126. So they paid 126. Now it's reported at 150. Again, we're going to have to reduce the machine by the difference, which is 24,000. Farhat was using the straight line method assuming six years so we're going to take 126 divided by six and it's going to give us the depreciation with no salvage value and brian kept on accounting for this the same way so they bought this a year later january 1st year two well first we have a forty-five thousand dollar gain computed as the difference between 105 150 and 105 we need to eliminate this also the asset and accumulated depreciation should be adjusted to the original balances in the selling company books. Simply put, we have to go back and bring the asset back to its original value and bring the accumulated depreciation to its original value. Original means on the company's selling books. Well, Brian also, since they bought the company, Brian recorded depreciation expense and we'll see how do, how do we bring it back. Brian also recorded depreciation expense for the acquired asset. And what did Brian said? Brian said, I'm going to keep the life the same, which is six years. One year went by. We still have five years to go. So Brian's going to take 150, what they paid for the asset on their books, divided by five, and they're going to depreciate the asset for 30,000. However, 
the depreciation on the books for the parent company was 126 divided by 6, which is 21,000. In other words, depreciation expense is overstated by 9,000. We also have to fix that. So let's take a look at the journal entries to fix all of those. One, the gain. We have to debit the gain to eliminate the gain. So that gain is gone. We have to credit the machine for 24,000 because when Brian bought the machine, Brian, record, Brian is recording the machine at 150, right? It needs to be reduced by 24. Why 24? To bring it back on the consolidated to 126. Also, we have to credit accumulated depreciation by 21,000. Why do we do this? What does this number represent? It re represents year one depreciation. When Farhat sold the when Farhat sold this machine, they debited because you had to debit accumulated depreciation as part of the entry. Accumulated depreciation is debited. You debited accumulated depreciation. Now you credit accumulated depreciation to bring back the the accumulated depreciation. So this is to to bring back the asset to its original value. Also, remember I told you we have nine thousand of depreciation overstated. Now we debit the debit accumulated depreciation and credit depreciation expense because 9,000 between the two companies because Brian reporting 30,000 of depreciation, which is not correct, it has to be 21. So when we consolidate, we reduce, we reduce depreciation expense and we reduce accumulated depreciation by 9,000. So the net depreciation on the consolidated is only 21. One more thing to take care of, in addition to the listed eliminating entries, Farhat should record an amortization of the research and development for year two. Remember the research and development asset? We added an asset of 150 and we said we're going to amortize it over five years. So each year will take $30,000. We debit amortization expense of 30 credit R&D credit in or in, in process R&D, which is an asset of 30,000. Why do we do that? Because now we are amortizing this in process R&D. Now let's take a look at the consolidated financial statement. Let's see how were these all these numbers fit in the big picture. So this is the parent numbers. This is the sub Brian and this the, those are given. Now these are the eliminating entries. Remember we reduce sales by 1,650,000. So we'll take the parent plus the sub minus the adjustment will give us the consolidated sales. Cost of goods sold for the parent plus cost of goods sold for Brian. And remember, we had an adjustment for cost of goods sold. We reduced cost of goods sold. Why did we have to do that? Remember, we reduced cost of goods sold. 1.5 million was an internal cost of goods sold for the, for the inventory transaction. Then we eliminated an additional 60,000 of cost of goods sold for the external sale. Therefore, the internal cost of goods, the internal, basically the eliminated cost of goods sold is 1,560 will need to be eliminated. Sales minus cost of goods sold give us consolidated gross profit. Operating expenses, we have to adjust it by in total of 21,000. Why 21,000? Let's take a look at this. We reduce depreciation expense by nine. We increase amortization by 30. The net is 21,000. Therefore, we increase depreciation operating expenses in total by 21,000. Equity and earnings. We cannot keep any equity and earnings because this is intercompany equity. We have to eliminate this. Interest income, um, no adjustment. Interest expense, parent plus sub, no adjustment. Gain on fixed asset. Well, that need, that's needs to be eliminated because the gains, those were intercompany gain of 82,500. Remember, we sold the land. We had a gain of 37,500. We sold the machine, a gain of 45. We need to eliminate this. There's no intercompany gain. Also, when we bought back the bond, we had a gain of 37,500. Now this is an actual gain, will need to be reported of 37,500. So all in all, the consolidated net income is 619. Well, for this company, since we own 100%, we don't need to subtract any NCI net income. Therefore, that's the consolidated net income, 619. If we own less than 100%, we would have had to deduct some portion for the NCI. Statement of retained earnings. We have the retained earnings of the parent. We have the retained earnings of Brian. Again, we cannot show we cannot show any equity for Brian. Therefore, we have to eliminate this. And what's left is the retained earning of the parent. Net income of the net income of the parent plus net income of the sub 
minus the adjustment of 593 will give us consolidated net income 619 that we just saw earlier. The dividend is 100% eliminated. What's left is zero. And this is the ending retained earnings, the consolidated ending retained earnings. Now let's take a look at the balance sheet. Again, the balance sheet, the same concept. We're going to take the parent plus the sub. And if there's any adjustment to take care of the adjustment. And in this example, as I told you, we're going to look at the adjustments. We did not make any adjustment to cash. Parent plus sub equal to 1.6 million consolidated cash. Account receivable, parent plus sub. And remember, we reduce account receivable, intercompany account receivable by 400,000. We also reduce intercompany payable by 400,000. So those were the debits and the credits. Inventory. We reduced inventory by 90,000. Parent plus sub. And remember, we had to reduce the inflated inventory by 90,000. Investment and bond. Farhat plus the sub minus the investment in bonds because we had to remove the investment in the bonds that the sub made. Fixed asset. Parent plus sub and 176,500. Where is this coming from? I made a note. It's worth noting that 175 is computed as follow. The balance sheet, uh, the balance sheet adjustment of 250, adjustment to accumulated depreciation net. This is the nine minus 21, and we deducted the land 37,500, and we deducted 24,000 to reduce the land and reduce the machine. We went over all these transactions and the eliminating entries. Therefore, the net is 175. There was no R&D. Now we had to add R&D in the consolidated. There was no goodwill. We had to add goodwill to the consolidated. Accounts payable, we reduced it by 4,000. Bonds payable, we reduced it by 450 when we eliminated the when we eliminate the investment and bonds. This is total liabilities. Common stock, again, we don't show we don't show the sub. It has, has to be gone. So we don't show a pick. It has to be gone. And retained earning is coming from the previous slide on the retained earning uh, retained earning when we compute it. Therefore. Common stock is the company's common stock, the parent company common stock, additional paid in capital is the parent company additional paid in capital, and retained earning is the consolidated retained earning, which is this amount here, 3,594,000. So I hope uh, this makes sense. Now, if you want more, more examples like this one, including NCI, because I kept NCI out because I don't want to complicate things for you. But if you want more, go to farhatlectures.com. And you should go to farhatlectures.com, work multiple choice, look at additional resources that's going to help you. Consolidation is an extremely important topic on the CPA exam. You don't, you don't want to walk into that exam room, Prometric Center, without being 100% confident. Study hard. Good luck. You can do it. Consolidation is not as bad as you think as long as you understand it. There will be easy points for you and stay safe.